top of the hour here. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar series. Uh, I am Julia Matevosian, Chief Engineer at Energy Systems Integration Group. ESIG also serves uh, in a leadership role in Global Power System Transformation Consortium, or GPST, whose mission is to bring together key actors to catalyze rapid clean energy transition at a pre unprecedented scale and speed. This is being done through a coordinated and holistic approach, providing the necessary knowledge, education, and support for power system operators across five action pillars. The foundation of the GPST is a group of six system operators from around the world uh, who are facing higher penetration of wind, solar, inverter-based uh, resources sooner than any other operator in the world. The five pillars of the consortium are research and peer learning, technical support, uh, workforce development, uh, technology adoption support, and open data and tools. Uh, ESIG is the lead on pillar one, which is research uh, and peer learning. For more information on GPST, um, you can go to www.globalpst.org. Uh, as the lead of Pillar 1, uh, ESIG would like to welcome you to this uh, January monthly webinar of our joint GPST Pillar 1 um, ESIG webinar series. The series is in addition to regular ESIG monthly webinar series and focuses specifically on GPST research agenda and associated topics uh, being addressed in Pillar 1. Topics are presented by both founding system operators, as is the case today, and uh, other advanced system operators active in Pillar 1, as well as members of industry and academia participating in activities of research agenda group and research advisory committee of Pillar 1 of GPST. Uh, an additional series of webinars on other four pillars uh, of the GPST is also being provided on a monthly basis through uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL. Uh, for those of you who would like to learn more about GPST and how to get engaged, uh, please uh, go to um, www.globalpst.org and click on Get Involved tab. Other information on ESIG can be found on www.esig.energy. Uh, next, I would like to cover some of the logistical matters before we get started. Uh, the phones will be muted for the duration of the webinar to avoid any unnecessary distractions. Uh, for the Q&A, as always, we use Slido platform at slido.com. Um, you need to open a browser window to go to slido.com and enter ESIG31 uh, as an event uh, code. The instructions are also at the bottom of the screen. Um, you'll see a thumbs up button next to questions on Slido to allow you to cast your vote uh, and help us prioritize um, the questions submitted. We plan to save 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end um, and then wrap up at the top of the hour. An email uh, with a link will be provided once the video file has been posted. Uh, we also plan to provide short responses to all unanswered questions after the webinar. So please don't hesitate to post your question on Slido and vote your favorite questions. Um, so now let's go ahead and uh, focus on the topic of the webinar today. Um, and we are going to cover an imbalanced reserve product to manage uncertainty between the day ahead and real time markets. This presentation will highlight California independent system operators new imbalance reserve product. The product aims to tackle net load forecast uncertainties by reserving flexible ramping capacity, thus helping CAISO to address uh, the challenges of integrating variable loads and renewables. Uh, our today's presenter is James Friedrich. Um, he is a lead policy developer at CAISO working on market design. Uh, James led the policy development uh, of the Day Ahead Market Enhancements Initiative, uh, which was approved in May 2023. This initiative introduces a new Day Ahead Market product called Imbalanced Reserve, uh, and this is what James will be talking about today. Okay, so once again, short reminder uh, to use Slido at slido.com uh, with the event code E631 to ask your questions. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. James, I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the to the ESIG team for having me at this webinar today. Can you confirm you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Great. So let's dive into it. So um, 
Uh, first, I want to I want to acknowledge that um, ESIG I know attracts experts from um, all across the industry, and I wanted to um, emphasize that my role as lead policy de policy developer at Kaiso, um, the title of my role doesn't reveal much about what I do at Kaiso, um, but as was explained, my my role is working on market design, um, which essentially means that my team and I develop and refine rules and structures that govern govern the whole get in the California ISO area and also across the West, as we'll talk about. Um, so that is uh, sort of the background of where I'm approaching this and keep that in mind as um, questions come in, I'll do my best to answer some of the specific questions that people have, but um, that's sort of the, the, the background that I have at Kaiso. Um, and as was mentioned, the imbalance reserve product, which is the topic of today's discussion, was part of a, a large stakeholder-driven effort, um, both to um, enhance our day ahead market structure, but also in combination with a regionalization effort that the CAISO continues to undertake and um, involving trying to bring in more entities in the West into our gay head market space, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well. So first, um, for those that aren't familiar, I need a little refresher with the California ISO itself. Um, the California ISO has uh, many, many responsibilities, as can be seen here on the screen. Um, first and foremost, we are the um, uh, electric grid operator for the California ISO balancing area, which encompasses about 80% of the load in California. So not the full um, California footprint. There are some other balancing areas there, um, but we do uh, manage the grid there. Um, we're also a, a grid operator that um, about 70% of the Western United the, um, um, energy in the Western United States participates in our Western energy imbalance market, which is our uh, real-time market that settles every 15 and five minutes. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, in, entities in orange represent active Western EIM participants. Um, and then there is a planned entry uh, of at least one entity in the Western EIM in 2026. Um, but as you can see, it encompasses quite a broad uh, spectrum of Western entities. And so we're um, very proud of that effort in today's discussion um, about the imbalance reserve product and what the imbalance reserve product intends to do for the market. It's important to keep in mind um, the sort of broad reach that the California ISO market has in the West. Um, because it's very helpful in integrating renewables. So um, let's go to the next slide. So we want to take it to the highest level possible here, which is that the California ISO and the Western grid is undergoing a rapid transformation, as many grids are across the country and across the world. And we are doing our best to integrate more and more renewable systems primarily wind and solar. Um, so California ISO today has about 23,000 megawatts of wind and solar capacity on the, on the California ISO system alone. And we'll show some numbers on that uh, later in the slide. Um, but we are um, in many ways leading the way in terms of renewable energy integration on the bulk electric system. And uh, this graphic essentially shows uh, the many different ways and strategies that KISO is involved in either directly or indirectly in helping to integrate renewables and grow uh, the penetration of renewables and the amount that the electric system can manage. And so um, just to go through a few of these, um, on the technology side, we have um, storage and demand response. Um, storage resources help balance the grid by storing excess energy and releasing it when demand is high. Uh, storage resources will be uh, a big customer of this new product and hopefully their flexibility in terms of their operation um, proves to be valuable in terms of this new imbalance reserve product. Um, demand response adjusts uh, consumer power usage in response to grid conditions and reduces the goal of reducing consumption during peak demand times. Um, so that's another part of the participation of the imbalance reserve product. Time of use rates is not something much something it's more of a retail side thing so it's not so much something that the California ISO 
uh, manages, but we do have um, uh, do support um, efforts by uh, Western utilities to implement time of use rates to get consumers to shift their use um, during off peak hours when renewable energy supply is abundant and less expensive. Um, we're exploring policies to reduce minimum operating levels for existing generators, which makes room for increased production from renewable sources. Um, as I mentioned, we manage the Western Im energy imbalance market and also through regional coordination um, allows for the balance of supply and demand across a wide region, which helps to integrate renewables more efficiently and cost effectively. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, electric vehicles um, use is growing and, and um, although the CAISO doesn't have any direct uh, control over electric vehicles or any sort of role in deploying them. Um, we're very interested in how um, electric vehicles are being uh, modeled into load forecasts and things like that, and, and interested in how electric vehicles can act as a form of demand response for energy storage. And finally, in terms of flexible resources, this is really sort of the bread and butter of the imbalanced reserve product and what we're trying to get at. But the imbalanced reserve product, um, we hope, will provide market incentives to um, invest in modern, fast responding energy resources that can quickly adjust to sudden increases or decreases in demand, which really complements the variable nature of renewable energy sources. So these strategies are all interrelated. And as I mentioned, the CAISO has in some ways a direct role in, in pursuing these and in other ways more of a supporting role, um, but all are aimed at creating a more resilient and sustainable energy system that can accommodate more and more renewables. So let's get into the topic here about the imbalanced reserve product itself. But I figured that uh, it's possible not every attendee on this list has um, good background knowledge in, in energy markets generally. And some people may, may uh, find a refresher useful. Um, but I have two slides here to sort of give a little background information to help you better understand the, the upcoming material. Um, so first, um, pretty much all North American markets have um, both a day ahead market, which is a forward financial market and a real time market um, that is more of a spot market in terms of um, clearing markets to uh, position resources to solve the energy and um, demand and supply balance here. So the day ahead market, as I mentioned, is a forward market. It operates one day in advance of the real time um, where participants can submit bids and offers for both energy and ancillary services for the next day. So that's the important part. Um, so today's day ahead market um, will be positioning uh, resources to meet the demand for tomorrow. Um, and it's sort of seen as a forward financial market where both suppliers and consumers like load um, are sort of positioning themselves to uh, uh, put the, positioning themselves financially to um, participate in the real time market. Then the real time market runs on the same day as real time real time being, um, you know, the, the whatever operating time you're thinking of um, and the real time market participants submit bids and offers for energy and ancillary services um, to uh, clear in real time. For most markets, real time means five minutes in advance of the actual operating hour. So uh, most markets will have uh, their final dispatch instructions to resources uh, five minutes in advance of when they're actually um, operating at, at that level. So um, it's, it's, it's pretty close to a spot market real time, but it's um, a five minute forward market. So um, that's what we have in the California ISO. And the reason why that's important is because the new imbalance reserve product that we're talking about today is a day ahead market product. And we'll talk a little bit about why it's a day ahead market product as opposed to a real time market product. Um, but so focusing in here on the CAISO's day ahead market, it's also important background to understand that the CAISO's day ahead market has two main processes. First is the IFM or the integrated forward market, which is essentially the financial part of the market. 
Um, it clears energy and ancillary service schedules based on bid-in demand and supply and does, throw, does that through a least cost optimization problem. And then after the IFM runs, the CAISA runs the RUC or the residual unit commitment. Um, the RUC process follows the IFM and its purpose is to ensure that there's enough capacity online to meet the day ahead demand forecast. So the IFM clears day ahead supply and demand based on bids only. There's no forecast involved in the, in the IFM. And so RUC is essentially a backstop mechanism to say, um, just in case the forward market clears at a level above or below the forecasted level, the RUC is sort of there as a backstop to say, okay, well, if the financial market doesn't quite clear up to the CAISO's forecast of demand, then the RUC can procure additional supply to, to meet that gap. So again, the IFM and the RUC are sequential processes in our day ahead market um, to clear energy supply and demand um, in the day ahead timeframe. So let's talk a little bit about, now that we have the background information about the day ahead market versus the real time market, and then the two day ahead market processes, the ISM and the RUC, let's take a step back and, and, and sort of look at what the problem statement the California ISO was trying to solve. So first is that, um, as I mentioned, the resource is changing and it's not just the CAISO, it's all across the West, it's all across the United States, it's all across the world. Um, as we tra transition our power grid towards more renewables in order to meet our climate change goals, it's inevitable that um, the, the resources that the CAISO system relies upon um, favor or features more wind and solar resources and less traditional resources um, like um, gas-fired resources and coal. So this here is a stacked bar chart um, that describes the California ISO's resource mix from the years 2014 to 2021. Um, so you can see a couple of features of this, mark, uh, of this chart. First, of course, is that um, the California ISO system relies upon um, quite a few different resource types uh, to meet its energy supply needs, um, which is a good thing. Um, you can see that gas fire generation is the most dominant feature and still, uh, still continues to this day to be the most dominant feature of our energy mix. Um, by the way, the, the vertical bar is, says capacity in megawatts. This represents total installed capacity of, the, of these different technology types. When it comes down to things like resource adequacy, um, the resource adequacy values of these types of different types of um, um, resource technologies may not be exactly the same. Um, so this is, keep in mind, this is installed capacity here. Um, you can uh, maybe make out a growth of renewables. There's a visible increase in the capacity of renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind over the years. Um, in, the, in the table below, we show that in 2014, our installed capacity of wind and solar was around 10,000 megawatts. As of January 1st, 2024, we're now at about 24,500. So more than double um, the capacity that we had a decade ago um, and about 8,000 megawatts less natural gas than we had in 2014 relative to 2024. Um, you can see some, some stable nuclear capacity that we have there. Um, you can see in the chart, some emerging technologies are coming on such as batteries. Um, since this chart ends at 2021, uh, we had a small uptick in grid scale batteries, which you can make out in the upper right, which is a little purple section of that stack chart. Um, today, as of June or January 1st, 2024, um, we have now have 7,000 megawatts of bat grid scale batteries, mostly lithium ion on our system today. Um, so that's a rapid change in that resource type as well. Um, so as an overall takeaway, you can see um, an uh, increased reliance on wind and solar, um, and, and in the later years, batteries, um, a decreased reliance on some of the dispatchable uh, fuel-fired um, generation, such as natural gas. 
So with that changing resource mix comes um, some challenges to, to tackle. The major challenge is that as you increase the amount of uh, wind and solar on your system, and also uh, in California specifically, we have a lot of behind the meter solar, which affects our loads. Um, and so with this, with all of this variability comes a lot of forecasting uncertainty. And that becomes a challenge because um, the forecasting, um, uh, the, the more uncertainty that you have, the more range of output. in the real time. And so it puts additional pressure in the real time space to be able to manage this type of uncertainty. And so what you see in this chart is this is a uh, what, what's called a violin plot um, because the, the figures sort of look like um, stretched out violins. Um, and it illustrates the imbalance of energy in megawatts over time from the period of October 2017 to July 2021. So as I put in the uh, bottom bar there, the term imbalance means taking the net load forecast, net load being load minus wind minus solar in the day ahead time frame, and then comparing that to the real time net load forecast and to see how much it has changed in that, in that time span. So positive values means that when you get to real time, the net load that you're now forecasting is more than the net load that you were forecasting in the day ahead time frame. And a negative value means the opposite, that in real time now, the net load that you're forecasting is less than the amount that you were forecasting in the day ahead. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. The violin shape um, of each um, vertical section represents the distribution of imbalances for a given period, and the width of the shape at different points indicates the frequency of occurrences at specific imbalances. And then the dots near the end of the distribution represent sort of the extreme values um, that can happen. And so you can see in the upward direction, um, imbalance amounts of up to 4,000 megawatts on many months. Um, there's one month here, which I think is um, August 2019, where there was a, a net load forecast error of more than 6,000 megawatts. And just for context, a typical summer day, the KISO system is about maybe 40,000 megawatts. So you're talking about a pretty substantial, maybe 15% um, on the extreme net load forecast error. Um, and, and it's pretty, it's relatively symmetric. You, I would say plus or minus 4,000 in the extreme. You can see in uh, summer of 2020, kind of on the middle right section, some downward imbalances of up to 6,000, maybe even up to 8,000 megawatts in the negative direction, which means that the day ahead market anticipated six to 8,000 megawatts more supply than actually um, was there in real time. Um, so with all that to say, um, these values make it very, very challenging for grid operators to manage supply and demand in the real time. Um, and they need a lot of flexibility to move between where the day ahead market solves and all of these possible outcomes in real time. Here. Oops, I went one too far. So slide number eight sort of wraps up the story. So we've shown that the KISO resource mix is changing. We've shown that the, um, the uh, prevalence of higher, higher renewables and behind the meter solar is causing greater variability and uncertainty in our ability to forecast the load in the day ahead timeframe by showing the violin chart on slide seven. And this chart, this chart sort of shows the market impact um, that, or, or one, one view of the market impact that this has. So um, this is sort of a box and whisker plot that in the vertical axis shows historical RUC adjustments. So 
we talked about RUC in the introduction where RUC runs after the financial market um, to clear uh, supply in the day ahead timeframe up to the CAISO's demand forecast. And because today the CAISO doesn't have a product, anything in the market that factors in the uncertainty that you saw in slide seven, the CAISO grid operators are getting really anxious and nervous about, well, what happens if I'm in a condition where all of a sudden I hit one of those 4,000 megawatt imbalances and now I don't have the supply pre-positioned to be able to flexibly meet that in real time, or at least I'm putting a lot of pressure on the real time market to be able to solve that quickly. So what they have been doing since 2017 is they take the RUC forecast and they add, a, they add something to it, which essentially is to say, I'm not comfortable with RUC um, running at the 50 percentile forecast anymore. I need to take that 50 percentile forecast and add some value. So what you're seeing in this part is sort of the frequency and magnitude of these, what we're calling RUC adjustments, which is um, short for the CAISO operator taking that RUC forecast and add a value to it to get, procure more supply in the day head market um, than you need, and then you get out of the 50 percentile forecast. So in terms of trends, what you see is as you move from left to right, which is forward in time, the dots start to become bars, the bars start to become larger, which really is just showing that both the frequency and the magnitude of these types of adjustments have increased. So when, as a market, as somebody who's working in market design, when you have your grid operators who are taking systemic action outside of the market to be able to solve in their mind some sort of reliability or operational issue that the market is not giving them, a light bulb clicks in your head to say, wait a minute, if, if operators are having to do this, something is missing in the market that should be doing this on their behalf, but it isn't. And so they have to take these manual actions. Um, so I just want to reference um, some of these values. Um, for most summers, we get about four to 6,000 of additional supply through the RUC process. So that sort of um, jives with slide seven, which showed that the upward reserve or upward density at the extreme level was about, you know, four to 6,000 in there. Sort of how you've come. In fact, in summer of 2022, there was one day ahead market interval. We had and that order. Um, so that's a huge amount of room to manage this sort of uncertainty. But James, you your internet sometimes is getting stuck. I, I was wondering if you could maybe turn your camera off to allow more bandwidth. Sure, absolutely. Sorry about that. Okay, so hopefully that provides a good um, overview of sort of the problem statement that Kaiso is facing, um, and now we can transition the, the conversation to um, the imbalance reserve product itself. Yes, we can still hear you, James. Go ahead. Okay, um, need more reserve to help fix over to six slides. So, at a high level, the imbalanced reserve product, what it does is it rever uh, reserves in the day ahead market upward and downward rampable capacity in the day ahead market to address the uncertainty in the lo net load forecast that might emerge between the day ahead and real time. So let's focus our attention on the figure here. First we have, uh, we'll start with the green bar. Um, the green bar represents a typical way that energy markets solve in the day ahead market by matching up the supply with the demand. Um, and you could imagine it clearing at some level 
um, represented by this green bar, but it's a single value. It's one value. What the imbalance reserve product does is it takes the, it procures um, upward capacity up to the blue line and downward capacity down to the red line, where essentially instead of procuring in the day ahead market just the green value, we're now procuring um, a range of values that can flexibly fluctuate between the blue and the red. So it, it sort of mirrors, if you think about the image on slide seven, it's sort of taking that image and saying, okay, in the day ahead timeframe, I need to buy reserves that I, such that I, the market can flexibly move anywhere between the, pot, the high uncertainty values and the low uncertainty values. And that's what the imbalance reserve product does essentially. Um, one thing to note, the term IRU um, stands for imbalance reserve up, and the term IRD stands for imbalance reserve down. Um, so the, the, the product is procured in both directions, both the upward uncertainty direction um, and the downward uncertainty direction. So let's talk a little bit more detail about the design of this product. So a couple of things here. We'll have about two slides to, to get into some of the more nitty gritty de design details of the imbalance reserve product. Um, first, as I mentioned in the first bullet, um, there is an upward and a downward product and it's biddable. So what that means is that just like energy or any of the other ancillary service products that Kaiso procures, um, resources or any, any eligible resource that can provide imbalance reserve bids for the product and the product is cleared on a least cost optimization basis, just like energy and ancillary services are. Um, so resources are actually um, for, um, by, are, uh, submitting a willingness to sell and the KISO market will find the set of resources that um, often, um, procures the um, uh, amount of imbalance reserve up and down that's needed at the least cost. The second bullet explains that the imbalance reserve product is procured in the integrated forward market. So think back to the earlier slide. Um, that's the first process in the day ahead market where the ISO is clearing the market to meet energy and ancillary services as well. So it's all co-optimized together, um, which allows the market to find the capacity um, between energy, ancillary services, and imbalance reserve um, that is the most cost optimal between the three. So it's the most, makes it the most efficient procurement that we can. Number three, or bullet three, the KAISO caps the awards at the resources 30 minute ramp capability and eligible resources to provide imbalance reserves must be dispatchable in the 15 minute market. So let's break that down a little bit. First, bank source is on an hourly interval. Um, at any given hour, the you can a resource can um, offer up to 30 minutes of how fast it can ramp from one one point to another to sell the imbalance reserve product. So, for example, if a resource can ramp um, in 30 minutes, uh, 50 megawatts up and down then that resource is allowed to bid up to 50 megawatts to sell in any given hour to the KISO. The last part, or the second part of that third bullet explains that resources must be dispatchable in the 15 minute market, um, which essentially is to say that um, resources must be able to receive at least 15 minute granular schedules from the KISO, which is basically just excluding certain types of resources that sell KISO energy on an hourly basis. For example, um, KISO buys certain intertie resources on an hourly basis. There are some demand response unit, uh, resources in the KISO that can only uh, provide resource, uh, a change in schedule every hour. So uh, the 15 minute requirement means is essential because the KISO market needs to be able to uh, very nimbly uh, move these resources around. And so that 15 minute dispatchability um, allows the KISO to be moving the resources scheduled on a 15 minute basis. 
Um, finally, what, what an imbalance reserve award does in the fourth bullet there is obligate a supplier to provide energy bids in the real-time market above or below their day ahead energy schedule for the quantity of their up and down award. So essentially, I'm gonna move back to slide nine here. Instead of looking at this figure on a system level, you can imagine this on a resource level where um, a resource gets an energy schedule in green and then also receives an imbalance reserve up schedule to some amount in blue and imbalance reserve down schedule to some amount in red. So that in real time, when that resource goes to bid its day ahead schedule in real time, it must offer the portion between the blue and the red line as an economic energy offer. And really what that does is it allows the KISO market to move the resource anywhere between the red and the blue line. And that's the purpose of that. Okay, so I'll move to slide 11. I have two more slides. Um, two more important uh, design features of the imbalance reserve product that are interesting. Um, the imbalance or the integrated forward market and the KISO's day ahead market will use a mechanism called deployment scenarios that ensure the deliverability of imbalance reserves without violating transmission constraints. So this, this concept of um, reserves for uncertainty and for flexibility for system operators is not new. Um, the KISO has a real-time, uh, a similar pro product in its real-time market. Um, the MISO or Midcontinent ISO has an uncertainty reserve product in its real-time market. Um, SPP has a day ahead in real time uncertainty product and um, the New York ISO is also looking at uncertainty reserves as well. Um, but what makes the, um, the KISO's product unique among the reserve product offerings is that we use this, this concept called deployment scenarios to ensure that just like we do for energy, um, we ensure that the reserves are procured on resources that are deliverable by modeling um, or, or including the imbalance reserve awards in the KISO's congestion management process in the market. And that is to ensure that um, if you needed to move between those blue and red lines, um, as, as I showed on the two, two slides ago, that that energy is not stuck behind a transmission constraint because if it is, the, um, that sort of reserve becomes more or less useless in real time um, because the KISO can't rely upon it because it's stuck behind a constraint. So one interesting um, result of this type of modeling for the reserve is that there are locational marginal prices for energy or imbalance reserves, just like there are for energy. Um, we have nodal prices in the KISO market, I want to say maybe up to 5,000 different pricing nodes. Um, each pricing node will have its own energy and imbalance reserve um, locational marginal price. So what that means is that the reserve will naturally be procured in places where on the system the reserves are most um, are most needed and can be a forward signal to system planners and um, um, resource resource planners to say where on the grid is the most valuable location for each of these types of reserves. Um, so that's a very valuable price signal. Finally, the, the imbalance reserve procurement is subject to a demand curve, which is just a fancy way of saying that um, the KISO will not buy, an un, uh, not buy the imbalance reserve requirement at, at any price. So if you think about the imbalance reserve product a little bit as insurance in real time, uh, you're not going to pay an indefinite, uh, unlimited amount of insurance depending on uh, the thing that you're insuring for. What we're insuring for is essentially that we need the, the, the market to be and the system to be set up to flexibly move between um, a range of possibilities. But we're not willing, consumers would not be willing to pay an, an unlimited amount for that. Um, and it means that uh, the price of a balanced reserve grows um, the KISO will um, na uh, naturally buy less and less of it.
So I think this is my last slide. Um, and I want to sort of wrap in the, our efforts on regionalization in the CAISO, which as we showed um, in one of the earlier slides about strategies to integrate renewables, um, regional markets are a very, very important feature of the CAISO strategy in integrating renewables. And that's for a few reasons. One is that the, the, the larger your market in terms of geographic footprint, the more, um, um, the more uh, you can spread out your forecast errors over a larger geographic footprint. There's more sort of geographic diversity. So if you can imagine in the Western United States, you could have um, solar in the desert Southwest, wind in the mountain West, and the uncertainties across, if all of those um, um, renewable resources were connected under one marketplace, you can sort of net out the uncertainties between um, renewable energy production in different areas. And that's what this, this chart on the right is intended to show. So the chart on the right is intended to show that um, if you were looking at Western market participants as individuals, and the amount of uncertainty that they would need to procure, uh, reserves that they would need to procure to address their own individual uncertainties, it ends up being a lot more than the uncertainty reserves that you would need to procure if you were to think about the region as a whole. And that's again, because in different areas of the region, positive uh, uncertainties net out with negative uncertainties. And as long as there's transmission to connect those areas, um, you can sort of um, um, net those errors out together. And that has huge savings in terms of operational costs because you're um, able to buy fewer reserves to meet the a same amount of uncertainty by spreading it out uh, across the Western footprint. It greatly reduces renewable curtailment because you're able to trade. Um, you know, for example, if the ISO has abundance of solar during the midday, it can find places to trade that excess power across the West that may not have as much solar. And then when wind is picking up on certain times of the day, that trade can go move the other way. And so um, having a larger, West, uh, larger regional market, um, I'll say finds a home for renewables in what, someplace um, in the market and that reduces re renewable curtailment, um, which of course um, is very important in terms of um, also reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well. So to conclude, um, the imbalanced reserve product, again, is one of many strategies the California ISO is taking to integrate renewables um, in combination with regional market participation. Um, we think the imbalanced reserve product will um, help the California ISO and the Western grid manage the variability and uncertainty of a growing penetration of renewables, reduce the operational costs by reducing the amount of reserves, spreading it over a larger footprint, reduce renewable curtailment, and um, also, um, which also means reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I hope that was a helpful overview and that concludes my, my presentation and happy to move on to the Q&A period. Great, thanks so much, James. It was very interesting. Uh, a lot of questions here. I'll use my privilege as the webinar lead and ask uh, one clarifying question that I had. Uh, so for imbalanced reserve product, is it so, is, did I understand correctly that this is just for, to make sure that in real time you have enough uh, dispatchable capacity? So in, in other words, it's not kept as a reserve that only system operator can release, but rather it's capacity available for dispatch in real time if it's economic and, you know, in terms of constraints, um, satisfy all transmission constraints. Is that correct? Or is it kept as a reserve that CAISO only can deploy when needed? So the, the beautiful thing about it is that the CAISO, the, the market will manage all of this by itself. So the CAISO operator doesn't need to um, release or not release these reserves. So when you get to real time, all, all of this shows up as energy. Mm -hmm. um, and what the imbalanced reserve product does is it, it obligates the resource to economically offer their energy over a range so that the real time market 
um, given the, the um, updated system conditions can say, okay, well, I had you at 100 in the day ahead market, but now conditions are changing and I need you to go down to 75 or something like that. So um, it's all hands off, managed by the market, and it sort of gives the real time market a, um, a band of flexibility to work with to manage this uncertainty. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so the first question is, can you describe how uh, imbalance reserve differs from other flex products in Kaiso? Absolutely. So um, imbalance reserve is very, I, I would call it a close cousin to a similar product that Kaiso market has It's in real time called the flexible ramping product. The flexible ramping product essentially has the exact same goals as the imbalance reserve, except that the imbalance reserve is looking at uncertainty between day ahead and real time, whereas the flexible ramping product is looking at uncertainty between real time market intervals. So it's a much smaller, um, you can imagine a much smaller um, band of uncertainty that's needed because the forecast is um, closer to the operational time. Um, and um, think of it like, I know my, my video is not up, but I think of it sort of like a, a funnel where the widest part of the funnel is the imbalance reserve product because that's where the um, uncertainty is greatest because you're farthest away from the real time. But as you move closer to the real time, um, the amount of uncertainty decreases. And so you can think of it as the narrowing of a funnel where the closer and closer you get to real time, the less and less reserves that you need to hold in order to address the uncertainty because the uncertainty decreases um, as you get closer. So I hope that helps. If there's more specific questions I can help answer, I'm happy to do that too. Yeah, I think that's one question that I had uh, accompany this. Is, is flex ramp also procured in day ahead? Nope, so uh, flexible ramping is only uh, um, a real-time market product. But again, the imbalance reserve, I mean, we could have called the imbalance reserve product sort of a day ahead flexible ramping product because they're, they are very similar. There are, there are some um, minor differences, but um, they're very, very similar in, in their, in their intention. Um, next one, uh, is the real time net load forecast made one hour ahead of the operating period? So the, um, that's about right. So in the, um, to clarify the figure, let me move back to this chart here. James, if you're talking, we cannot hear you. Fifteen minute forecast, and so you have a forecast at eight o'clock. You have a forecast at eight fifteen, at eight thirty, and eight five. And so the comparison is between um, those series of forecasts. Um, and in real time, um, so that's what, that's what that figure shows in slide seven. Now the net load forecast in um, real time actually updates every five minutes. Every five minutes, a new forecast is, is produced. Um, but this particular chart, uh, chart, the reference for what constitutes a real time net load forecast is every 15 minutes you take the value. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. And your sound went away for a second, but there is a next question that maybe will shed some light. Um, the question is how the uncertainty reserve uh, requirement is established. So you might have said it um, during the time when you disappeared, but uh, would you please repeat again? Sure, yeah. So um, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, detailed questions, please do follow up with me. Um, cause it, it's quite complicated, but, but is, um, here on slide seven, you could imagine that you have, um, a data set 
of imbalances between day ahead and real time. So instead of this violin plot, you can imagine a scatter plot um, that records every um, imbalance that's observed. And what you do is essentially you take that data set and what the KAISO will do is it will um, um, run that through a statistical regression uh, that's called quantile regression. So simple, simple uh, statistical regression estimates the mean response or the average response um, in, in response to a change in some other variable. Does is it estimates a quantile, or sort of, uh, in this case, the 97.5 percentile and the two and a half percentile. The word uncertainty requirement is 97.5 percentile expected. But that means I expect that the amount of uncertainty that you observe between day ahead and real time falls within the up and down requirement. Um, if you want more technical detail on that method, um, feel free to follow up with me and we can get deeper into that. Thank you. Um, again, your, your voice went away for a bit. Um, but I, I had a follow up question on this one. Maybe you mentioned, uh, but, but please say again, uh, this requirements are they, uh, what is the resolution? Is it hourly? Is it for, you know, 5 minute intervals? They're hourly. They so when you are estimating um, on an hourly basis, so. Yeah, so when you're estimating the need, um. Are you splitting it, say, by months and into um, each hour bins, or are you looking across, you know, the entire months? So, uh, in other words, are you taking into account time of day um, and months of the year when determining requirements? Yeah. So we basically look out. Um, we we start from. Um, Six months behind, um, or actually it might be three months. So today's date going back three months. And then we take last year's data and go forward three months from there. So it's sort of like a six month window. And yes, it is account or it does um, account for um, time of day. So there's a different requirement at different times of the day. So that's part of the regression is, is the time. Um, and then the, um, yes, there is also monthly um, sort of seasonality there. So that's captured in the model as well. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is kind of towards the beginning of your presentation. Why would the rock adjustment start with uh, P50 forecast? Why not to start with P90, for example? Yeah, so. Um, when the RUC was designed back in the day, um, there wasn't this, we didn't have a high prevalence of renewables on the system. So it was sufficient for a long time for the KISO to be able to solve the RUC to the 50th percentile forecast because there wasn't a whole lot of variability and, and uncertainty on the system. So your, your, your question is, is exactly right. What the operators, grid operators started to notice is to say, the P50 is not enough anymore and they started to, um, if we look at this slide, these values um, sort of represent a high, a really high percentile forecast, like a P95 or P95. The product is to say, well, let's instead of having the operators bias the ruck in this way, we'll procure the reserves that they're really looking for through the market. Um, and so, they, what the expectation is that once the imbalance is implemented, that these types of this figure would basically go to zero. Um, it may not completely eliminate them, but 
Um, in most cases, we would expect that the operators would no longer need to do this action because the imbalance. Thank you. Um, next yeah. question is um, um, the net load, um, as you were talking about, uh, does this include, um, so it's basically load after any behind the meter PV minus grid PV minus grid wind, is that correct? James? James, we cannot hear you anymore. I'm not sure if you're talking. Hi, Julia, I think I missed my question. Uh, yeah, uh, so the question was, can you clarify uh, when you say net load, um, is it observed load after behind the meter PV minus grid PV minus grid wind, or is it anything else? James, are you there? Can you hear me okay? Uh, just just now. So you basically I uh, haven't heard anything you said before that. I I, I heard the question. The is load the load behind the meter solar is it the Uh, James, I think you're having troubles with internet. I think what we'll do, and we only have three minutes left, is that we'll take all the questions, probably including even ones that um, I got to uh, ask before. Um, we'll take them offline, and maybe if you could be so kind as to answer these, uh, and I'll go ahead and wrap up because we cannot hear you anymore. Um, all right, so uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Some technical difficulties, uh, we're not too far away from the top of the hour. So uh, we'll just wrap up. As I mentioned earlier, the email will go out once the video file has been posted uh, and we'll get responses to all unanswered questions uh, posted as quickly as possible. And as I mentioned, we'll try to get James to answer even the questions that I got to ask because there were some troubles um, hearing his answers. We appreciate your engagement, and if you would like to stay engaged, I would invite you to participate in the next ESIG webinar on February 15th, where Antti uh, Harola from uh, Finland will talk about measures to address stability issues in FinGrid. Further information on all of our ESIG webinars can be found on our website at www.esig.energy under events, uh, and uh, you are all invited to attend. Information on GPST webinars can be found at www.globalpst.org. I also wanted to remind you all about uh, the upcoming ESIG Spring Workshop during the last week of March in Tucson, Arizona, where we will be we will continue discussing uh, latest advancements and topics related to energy transition. The workshop program has already been posted, and early bird registration is available to ESIG members until February 21st. Please see the events link um, that has been just posted in the chat um, for further information. James, uh, I would like to thank you once again for a very timely webinar and thank you all for your interest and for your um, interesting questions. We, we got quite a bit of questions here and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the near future. And in the meantime, everyone take care, stay safe and thanks again for your participation. Bye now.